and this program on environmental justice is part of that. It's also part of Earth Week, uh, which I, I'm sure a lot of you are also have gone to some other activities this week or will be, or will be doing so. Uh, we have a great speaker today. His name is Danny Favors, professor at Northeastern University. He's a leading researcher on the issue of environmental justice. He's also um, he's also very active. Uh, he's co-founded a couple of organizations that are playing a leading role in working on this issue in the state of Massachusetts, and he's also working at a national level, so he walks the walk as well as talking the talk. So I'd like to introduce Danny Faber. Thanks. I'm going to stand here, so hopefully if I, I'll try and remain motionless. So if you're behind a pole or something, this is pretty much where I plan to stand. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, just a little background on myself. I'm director of the Northeastern Environmental Justice Research Collaborative at Northeastern University. And over the last uh, few years, I've been working with the leadership of the environmental justice movement throughout the United States, looking at issues ranging from access to foundation money in order to grow the movement, as well as looking at various strategies and tactics that movement could employ to become more effective. Um, done a lot of work internationally as well as Central America and more recently around climate change in the Pacific Islands. Um, I would like to talk today about um, what I see as uh, environmental injustice here in Massachusetts and start by talking about what I see as a major paradox which we are currently confronting in the United States uh, particularly what I see as a, a crisis of environmentalism. You can go to the next slide. I'll just point to you. Um, in particular, what I see as a major paradox. And the paradox is this. Namely, on one hand, over the last 30, 40 years, the U.S. environmental movement has merged as one of the most powerful social movements in this country's history. About 41 million Americans belong to 10, some 10,000 different organizations. Uh, millions more belong to different uh, clubs, um, college associations, neighborhood groups, and so forth. So it's one of the most uh, powerful, largest social movements in this country's history. And during the so-called environmental decade of the 1970s, in fact, there were some 20 different major environmental statutes that were passed. And a majority of the American people today consider themselves to be strong supporters of environmental causes, um, even if it means paying more money out of their pocket. So that's on one hand. But on the other hand, um, next slide. On the other hand, the movement, although it's won many battles along the way, is losing the war. Um, the ecological crisis continues to intensify. It's deepening, and it's becoming global in scope. And so there are different manifestations of this that I'd like to talk about, one being the chemicalization of our everyday environment. There are about 80,000 different chemicals registered for use by industry now in the United States. There's enough hazardous waste produced every day to fill Fenway Park from the top to the bottom. And uh, a lot of it includes mining waste. And uh, many of these chemicals are finding themselves into our larger environment. So there's a notion called body burden, or toxic trespass, that the CDC has done studies, a lot of studies along these lines. The notion is that each one of us in this room carries between two and 300 different chemicals in our body every day that are considered to be toxic. And they're having a profound impact on the health and well-being of the American people. Um, and that including the unborn or the preborn, um, the studies that have been done by the CDC found that, for example, in uh, children, in the umbilical cord blood, uh, on any given day, there's 180 different chemicals present which are linked to cancer, 217 which are neurotoxins that cause damage to neurological systems, and 208 that are linked to birth defects. And this chemicalization of our everyday environment, the way in which they're becoming part of our bodies, is called toxic trespass because I didn't give permission for anyone to put those chemicals there, but the pathway is through our food, it's through our air, it's through our water, it's through the types of personal care products that we use. An example of that would be 50% of all the lipsticks sold in the United States contains lead. Um, some of it at uh, fairly uh, significant levels. Uh, Johnson & Johnson sells a baby shampoo that contains a number of different carcinogens. In fact, they're not allowed to sell that same formulation in Europe because Europe considers it toxic. They have to make a different formulation that they sell in Europe. 
There's a whole uh, array of baby shampoos called uh, Sesame Street line that also uh, contains carcinogens like formaldehyde. So um, if you look at the range of personal care products, and by the way, if, you, if you're interested and you want to go home and pull something off your medicine cabinet, there's a website called Skin Deep. And it's a pretty amazing website. You can go in there and pull almost any product, uh, colognes, perfumes, whatever it might be, and look it up on the website, and it will tell you the ingredients. A lot of perfumes are trade secrets, but they won't reveal the, the uh, substances. But nevertheless, you can get a good idea. Um, something like 17%, there was a new study that came out last year, 17% of all the apple juice that's sold in the United States contains levels of arsenic that are considered unsafe for human consumption. That was a U.S. government study. So we have all these different pathways of exposure to uh, toxic chemicals. And more and more scientists have believed that that has a, a very significant role in the cancer epidemic in the United States. Half a million Americans die of cancer each and every year. And one out of every two men and one out of every three women in this room are going to get cancer in their lifetime. In this particular area, um, New Bedford, Fall River, over to the Cape, in fact, has one of the highest rates of breast cancer in the entire United States. I think it's second only to Long Island. And so, um, Chemicalization of the environment is playing a profound role in many of the types of health problems that we're seeing. Um, asthma um, now affects six million children. More children now die of cancer than any other disease for the first time in U.S. history. And the problem seems to be growing worse. There's a new study that came out uh, last week, week before, looking at autism. And now there's a stronger belief that there might be linkages to environmental toxins there. State of the evidence was a report on breast cancer. Scientific community now believes that 80 to 90% of all breast cancer cases are related to environmental exposures of, of one kind or another, particularly toxic chemicals. In fact, you can take a woman from a culture where breast cancer is relatively unknown, uh, bring her to the United States, and within one generation, certainly two, you're going to see similar rates of breast cancer as you would in the rest of the U.S. population which tells you right there that there's something environmental, there's something that's germane to our environment in the United States, which is a trigger for cancer. Genetics play some role, but they may give you a better defense or a weaker defense, but um, it's not the cause. There's a trigger, and your genetics may be able to ward off that trigger, but that trigger very often is environmental toxins of one sort or another. So. Um, next slide. There's also a, a number of uh, evidence, um, which I'll talk about uh, briefly if we want to. Um, I'm doing a lot of work on climate change, climate justice, and new studies that are coming out around this uh, point to the fact that climate change is far more serious than what was thought 5, 10, 15 years ago, that it's accelerating. In fact, according to James Hansen, who was a leading climatologist in the country, heads up the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association's climate program, that climate change is in fact feeding upon itself in the sense that there are all these feedback mechanisms at work that they didn't really understand 10, 15 years ago. They weren't present um, in, the, in the research that was being done, but are now rearing um, their ugly heads. So for example, if Alaska's increased 10 degrees in temperature Fahrenheit since 1950, what you have in much of the northern latitudes is a melting of the permafrost. And as that occurs, biological processes are unleashed where methane is, is re being released from um, the permafrost and in quite significant levels. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, 100 times more potent than CO2. And so it threatens to accelerate the process of global warming. We just went through the warmest year on record in the United States from last April to this April. In fact, a lot of records were completely shattered. 10 of the hottest years of record have occurred over the last 13, 14 years. And um, there was a heat wave in Europe in 2005, which killed 51,000 people. Texas, some of the models actually pr uh, predict a spread of desertification um, in the western United States from Arizona and New Mexico into Texas and Oklahoma. Texas is going through a prolonged drought, excessive heat waves uh, last year. There's a, a study that was put about the University of New Hampshire which estimates that under a high emission scenario that we're going to go from roughly three to five days a year maybe where we are over 100 degrees 
to 14 to 28 days above 100 degrees, certainly by the end of this century, if not before, maybe as soon as 60 years. Yes? Is that local? That is, that's here at Boston, New England area, up into New Hampshire, which means if you want to retire and move to Florida for many of your students at that time, you won't have to because the climate of Florida and South Carolina will move here, so. Um, um, but um, others like Hansen, more, more of the scientific community says that we should really be around 320 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, maybe 350 max. We're currently at 397, and most of the international agreements want to stabilize climate at 450 parts per million. And more and more of the climatologists say that 450 parts per million takes us into climate catastrophe, that we will exit the Holocene and enter a new climactic period, the Anthropocene. And the worry now is they're seeing a far more accelerated breakup of Greenland than was anticipated uh, 10 years ago formation of moons and so forth. And of course, if Greenland goes, then the world's ocean levels increase 20 feet. If you add West Antarctica to that, that's another 20 feet. And that's 40 feet. So most of the studies didn't think that was within the realm of possibility for hundreds of years. And now they're starting to re-examine this because uh, the rates of uh, warming have far surpassed what was predicted to happen 10 years ago. So. Um, we have this huge gulf between what the scientific community is saying and what our political leadership is saying, what is possible. Scientific community is saying this is necessary. Political leadership is saying this is what's possible. And the gulf is really quite wide. So um, the point I'm making is that over the past two or three or four decades, we've created one of the most sophisticated systems of environmental policy of any nation in the world but it's grossly inadequate for protecting the environment and the ecological crisis is continuing to deepen. So we have a crisis of environmental policy and it's fostering a political reaction on both the left and the right in American politics. So on the right, we have some of the leading corporate polluters in the country coming together and say, look, environmental policy costs us a lot of money, doesn't result in us contributing to greater efficiency and greater profits, it's a drain on our profitability we need to scale back environmental protection. We need to refocus efforts in developing new energy sources, particularly fossil fuels, fuels from hell, gas, oil, coal, over fuels from heaven, solar, wind, so forth. And that environmental policy often stands in the way. So what's happened is larger corporate uh, polluters, agribusiness, petrochemical companies, oil and gas, uh, interest, a lot of agribusiness firms have come together and organized themselves politically into a very sophisticated network of think tanks, policy institutes, um, uh, research centers, public relations campaigns, and so forth, aimed at discrediting the notion that the environmental crisis is real, that climate change is real, and that uh, if there is a problem, then we need to offer incentives and market-based mechanisms, free market environmentalism, which I consider to be sort of an oxymoron, um, rather than penalizing corporate uh, actors for bad behavior. And um, so, I'm sorry you can't really see this. This is an example of the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Um, and uh, you go to this website, it's really interesting, exxonsecret.org. They looked just at Exxon and the amount of money that they put into anti-environmental think tanks. Um, the 20 leading anti-environmental uh, think tanks in the United States have received a billion dollars over the last 10 years in funding aimed primarily at discrediting the environmental movement, the notion that there needs to be a dismantling of the federal government um, policy apparatus that we need to weaken environmental laws to promote economic growth. And that includes the creation of what are called astroturf organizations. That is, they appear to be green on the outside, but they're really kind of plastic on the inside. Like the Global Climate Coalition was an organization that was set up by the oil industry to try and discredit the notion that global warming is real. The Competitive Enterprise Institute, which often has interlocking directorships between the different think tanks, many of them occupied key positions in the federal government, particularly in the previous administration. Um, offers tens of thousands of dollars to any scientist who will produce a report which will discredit global warming. Um, Dick Cheney's wife, Lynn Cheney, is a fellow at the um, American Enterprise Institute. We do the same thing. The last uh, study that was produced 
in coordination with funding from the Koch family, which is a major contributor to these uh, policy apparatus and one of the largest petrochemical companies in the United States, heavily involved in energy, fossil fuel extraction, and so forth. Um, a scientist who was a climate skeptic from Berkeley produced a, um, got the funding and was supposed to produce a study showing that global warming is a hoax, actually came back and said, oh, global warming is not only real, but it's, it's very significant and dangerous. And so sometimes these efforts prove embarrassing for these uh, um, think tanks, but nevertheless, they have a very uh, potent presence. Also, just as significantly, they're pouring huge sums of money into lobbying, um, about $125 million to feed the last climate bill um, from the oil and gas industry alone, and also millions and millions of dollars into candidates for federal and state office, which are hostile to the environmental movement, which want to see a rollback in environmental policy. This is the first election in my memory where you've had major candidates for president in the Republican Party who called for the abolition, not the not the downsizing, but the abolition of the Environmental Protection Agency. So we are living through a major assault led by the largest corporate polluters, some of those powerful corporations on the face of the planet, um, an attempt to uh, dismantle the environmental protection apparatus that has been set up in this country. On the other hand, uh, oh, before I forget, um, another feature of this is, is globalization. And, um, so in order to cut costs and boost competitiveness, scale back the size of the federal government, reduce, reduce taxes, reduce environmental protection, and also go global. So what we're seeing is an increasing number of US corporations are looking to make foreign direct investment in countries where there's very little environmental protection, uh, worker health and safety laws, so they have a better business climate and they make more money. Um, to move their dirty industries to pollution havens in places like Philippines or China, or to export um, dangerous commodities um, and products that are sometimes highly restricted or banned for use here to other countries. U.S. exports 16 tons of carcinogenic pesticides every hour that are banned for use in the United States or highly restricted. So you can't, um, they're exempted under federal law. Um, even if they're banned for use here, if you're just producing them for export, you can do so. So 16 tons a day, uh, uh, an hour, every day of the week. And unfortunately, what happens is if many of these pesticides are used on crops in the global south or elsewhere, then they're re-imported back in the United States. It's called the circle of poison. So even though DDT or aldrin or dildrin or other granochlorines are banned for use here, they can still come back and end up on the dinner table of US consumers because they're still being sold and used abroad. So 40% of all the Guatemalan, uh, of all the peas that come into the country from Guatemala contain pesticide residues of chemicals that are banned or highly restricted for use uh, in the United States. 17% of the strawberries coming from Mexico, which is a real problem for me because summer's almost here and I love sitting on the uh, edge of the water somewhere drinking strawberry margaritas. So I can't quite enjoy the drink the same way um, unless I get organic strawberries. So, um, this has become a real serious issue in the age of globalization where you have this circle of poison. And then finally, in the waste circuit, more and more toxic waste that's being produced in northern countries is being exported to the global south. Um, in fact, next slide. Um, Lawrence Summers is a uh, very important person. He was the president of Harvard University. He's one of the most important economic policy planners under the Obama administration. Under the Clinton administration, he was one of the key architects of the North American Free Trade Agreement. And when he was chief economist at the World Bank, he wrote this memo that said, just between you and me, shouldn't the World Bank be encouraging more migration of dirty industries to the less developed countries? I think the economic logic behind dumping a load of toxic waste in the lowest wage country is impeccable, and we should face up to that. I've always thought that the underpopulated under countries such as Africa are vastly underpolluted. So what he's saying by that is from a uh, uh, perspective of an economist, where he's completely right, although I think he's morally completely wrong, is that um, it makes sense from the perspective of the World Bank and financial planners to externalize these environmental hazards onto people that are playing a much more peripheral role in the world economy. But I tell my students, when you go for a job interview, 
um, and they ask you on the uh, application process whether you smoke, you better say you don't if you want the job because more and more uh, employers are coming under pressure from their insurance companies to not hire workers who smoke because they know they have lower labor productivity, they miss more days, they have higher health care costs and so forth. So companies don't want to hire workers who smoke. In fact, Kemlon recently fired a worker because they did a drug test on him and they found nicotine in the system. They didn't find marijuana or heroin or cocaine, they found nicotine in the system and in terms of his contract where, and, he, and ironically he's applying poisons to yards, but he has nicotine in his system so he was fired. Um, so there's a lot of social capital invested in your training and education once you graduate from a college. So if you get sick, um, it can cost the company money. You have insurance uh, coverage and uh, retirement package. But if you're flipping burgers at McDonald's and you get sick, you don't have health insurance, they can dismiss you, bring someone in, train them to do that job in two hours. The economic ramifications for the company aren't that great. So that's the analogy, right? So the people who would play a more peripheral role in the world economy, such as peoples of Africa, that's where you want to send the toxic waste. That's where you want to see the ecological crisis displaced. So there's a very important phenomenon that's going on in terms of these ecological sacrifice zones or pollution havens. They exist not only in the global economy, <coughs> but they also exist in the United States. They also exist in Massachusetts. So the question I would pose to you, is Fall River such a community? Is New Bedford, for example, where I just came from, such a community? We'll go on to the next slide. So China is an example, uh, surpassed the United States in 2003 as a leading recipient of foreign direct investment in the world. Very poor system of environmental enforcement. Worker health and safety laws are ignored. Uh, tremendous repression exercised against labor um, over wages and working conditions. The Foxconn plant in uh, um, China where they make the iPods and your um, a lot of the uh, Mac and most of the Apple products. Working conditions are so harsh there that the company put up all these nets all around the uh, buildings, all around the factories, because they're having so many workers commit suicide that they were throwing themselves off the building. And they uh, actually had the workers sign pledges, which I think is completely ineffective, pledging not to commit suicide as a, a term of their employment. Um, so a tremendous repression of movements that try to work for better conditions in China. And as a result of that, next slide, um, you have what is literally an ecological catastrophe. Over a million people die in China from bad air alone each year. Air pollution kills a million people in China every year. Um, they released, the World Bank did this report with that estimate right prior to the um, Olympics in Beijing. The Chinese government was so concerned about this because um, they were already having environmental riots. They averaged about 200 environmental riots throughout the country each year. They were worried that this was going to cause a lot more unrest. They put a lot of political pressure on the World Bank and over the objections of the scientists, they reduced that number from 1 million to 750,000 in the report. But if you go back and look at the original studies, it was a million people. Um, next slide. And the same is true with regard to water quality. About a third of the lakes, rivers, and streams um, are significantly contaminated where they pose a threat to human health. Um, 360 million people, population, greater than population in the United States, don't have access to a uh, drink, set of drinking water. It causes about 60,000 uh, premature deaths uh, every year. So China is an ecological nightmare. <coughs> and it's a, one of those countries where a lot of multinationals can run away to and cut their operating expenses, not only with regard to labor, but with regard to environmental safety as well. So next slide. Um, so we have this other reaction that's taking place to this crisis of environmentalism, where you have the evolution of a grassroots environmentalism in the United States, and particularly an environmental justice movement that is now developing its own critique of the limitations of traditional environmental policy that's calling for clean production, and green chemistry, and um, this notion that we can't divorce social justice issues from environmental issues, that they go hand in hand. And there's many different components to this critique. Um, I think I'll just focus on one or two in the interest of time. But one of the largest critiques is that most environmental policy tends to take a very single issue-oriented approach to what are very complicated and uh, interrelated uh, problems. 
And so as a result of that, for example, in 1988, when ocean dumping of sewage sludge was banned, because which is a good law in the face of it. We want to be able to go to the beach uh, along the Jersey Shore, New York Shore, Massachusetts, and not have to worry about sewage sludge washing up on the beaches, right? So what New York City did was they would load 3,000 railroad cars uh, every week and transport that 2,000 miles across country and deposit it in communities like Sierra Blanca, Texas, which is 80% Hispanic, 50% of the population lives below the poverty line, and they become the repository, so to speak, for New York City's crap. Now, uh, the problem with this is that not only is it laden with pathogens, but in New York City, a lot of companies get rid of their toxic waste by just dumping it down the toilet in the sewer system. It's one of the cheapest ways of doing it. So when you process that sewage sludge, it's laden with heavy metals. It's essentially toxic. But it's completely unregulated. So, so you have facilities in Texas that are processing these sewage sludge. And George Bush created 200 such sites in Texas um, when he was governor for sewage sludge from the eastern United States. Um, um, they process that sewage sludge into organic fertilizer. So if you go to Home Depot or someplace and you want to buy organic fertilizer, you make sure it's animal, like it's chicken manure or some kind of animal manure, because if it doesn't say, then very likely um, it's called biosolids. It's reprocessed sewage sludge that they're selling as fertilizer. And it's completely unregulated and again, um, the U.S. government, in fact, working with the industry, had a plan to convince American farmers to apply it as fertilizer to commercial crops uh, in the United States. So the point I'm making here is this is an example where you sort of in, in, you devise a, 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 me, a policy which is designed to attack a problem, but it unintentionally results in the creation of a new problem that affects people far away in another part of the country that in the past had not been impacted. Same is true with the Resource Recovery and Conservation Act. So it's a good thing you not, can't dump uh, toxic waste in, say, New Bedford Harbor anymore. But if it's collected by chemical waste management and they're looking to take the toxic waste elsewhere and maybe burn it in an incinerator in Fall River or somewhere else, then um, that's going to produce a lot of toxins in the air and you displace the problem from one form into another form, from one part of the country to another part of the country and form one group to another. So go to the next slide. So that's some of the major limitations with this um, approach. So um, obviously, um, from the perspective of industry, whenever they go into a community and uh, engage in actions which are harmful to the health and well-being of the residents in that community, that's a highly political act. Most people are going to see that as being very antisocial. If I came into all your rooms in the middle of the night and put arsenic in your apple juice and you found out about it, since it's a pretty potent neurotoxin, I assume, at least I hope, that you would call the police and report me and uh, hopefully have me arrested and charged with assault or attempted homicide or something along those lines, right? Um, so unfortunately, many times when industry does it, it's called a discharge permit and it's considered to be perfectly legal and fine. And most of the environmental policies that are adopted in the United States have an acceptable death rate, right? So what's the level of exposure to a community? What's the death rate at this particular exposure level that was considered acceptable? It varies from substance to substance. It can be one in a million. It can be one in 10,000. Um, but that's how environmental policy is made. And it's based on, on the notion of exposure to one single chemical substance. When the reality is if there's 80,000 different chemicals used and you're carrying over two to 300 in your body at any one given time, that scientists know that they, in fact, interact with each other in a synergistic fashion and multiply the impact of each other, sometimes in very profound ways. So the notion is that we can regulate our exposure to one particular substance at levels that are considered safe is really a faulty notion. And furthermore, most of the standards that were set 20 or 30 years ago regarding lead or anything else that you want to think of, we now know today cause significant harm, right? So what I'm saying to you is the whole system of environmental policy making is based upon a really flawed science and a flawed notion of, of managing risk. And so um, anyway, going back to this notion, so um, how is industry then engaging in, in acts which are contrary to public health and getting away with it. So sometimes they will choose the path of, of 
the most political expediency, even if it's slightly more expensive. Industry wants to release pollution in the environment because to install scrubbers on a smokestack or to collect it and send it to a, a federal land site can be very, very expensive. So they want to find ways to cut costs, particularly in a recession when markets are shrinking. But they want to do it in a way which is politically possible, politically feasible. So how is that being done in the United States? I'm just going to highlight two or three methods in the next one. So one is um, crime pays, particularly environmental crime. One of the cheapest ways to dispose of, say, toxic waste, for example, is to hire the mafia or orga other organized crime interests to get rid of the toxic waste for you. This is Valley of the Drums in Louisville, which overnight appeared like 10,000 uh, barrels of um, toxic waste that were just dumped in this valley uh, outside of Louisville. Um, go to the next slide. Um, I, I like to go on vacations quite a bit with my in-laws to uh, the Jersey Shore. And yes, I am using the word in-laws and vacation in the same sentence. Um, we have a great time, so. Um, but uh, one year we were down at Ocean City, and uh, which is near Atlantic City, and all the beaches north and south of there were being closed because they were having all this medical waste that was uh, washing up on the beaches. And so what was happening is, um, to incinerate or dispose of medical waste is very expensive, so a lot of entities will hire organized crime, the mafia, in particular around New Jersey, has been very, very strong. This is a great book by Scarpiti, I love the name, called The Mafia and Toxic Waste in America, and uh, sort of documents this. And so they go out and dump it in the, in the oceans, um, but they don't want to dump it where it comes up on the beaches around Atlantic City, you know, because the mafia and Atlantic City kind of go close together, or if they do, they're not gonna close the beaches anyway. But they, they were closing the beaches because of these hypodermic needles. And when I was there, since they were traced back, it becomes such a problem that they were coding the hypodermic needles. So in this particular instance, they were able to look up the codes and trace it back to a dentist who had hired in Philadelphia and hired these organized crime interests mm -hmm. to uh, dump it illegally. So there was a major study done um, by a number of different people, but Arthur Anderson did one very interesting. It was a self-reported survey of the lawyers of the largest Fortune 500 companies in the United States, self-reported that they routinely violate the nation's major environmental laws, Clean Air Act, Clean Air Water Act, on a weekly basis. Not a yearly basis, on a weekly basis. So what that means is that environmental crime is normative. It's not the exception to the rule. It is the rule. And under the Bush administration, where there was very little enforcement, dramatic scale back of enforcement, um, it's become uh, you know, epidemic. Massey Coal Company had 60,000 violations, reported violations, leading up to the mine disaster that resulted in the death of those 17 mine workers in, um, in Kentucky. 60,000 violations. The average fine that was assessed against the company over the last 10 years in the United States where they normally violate a law that results in the death of a worker is $1,200. So in the testimony that Massey was putting together, they said, look, it's just a cost of doing business. It's cheaper for them to pay the fines because they're so insignificant than it is to make major changes in their operations because they would see a greater profit loss. So this assault on the federal government, an attempt to roll back policy, has been particularly effective with regard to enforcement. Um, and even when the fines are assessed, when Bush left office, there were $35 billion, according to the Associated Press, $35 billion in uncollected fines by the Treasury Department that had been assessed against uh, bad corporate actors. So they weren't even collecting the fines. So it was a basically a license to industry to violate the law. Uh, next slide. Um, another is geographic displacement. Next slide. So uh, one strategy here is if you have a lot of local opposition, you have a, a short smokestack here, a lot of pollution in, in a close community, then you can build a taller smokestack so that the pollution becomes born in the upper air currents and travels far away from the community in which the smokestack is located. So if you look in the United States, particularly west of Mississippi, some of the tallest man-made structures in the country, they aren't skyscrapers. They aren't bridges, they're smokestacks. This particular smokestack here is taller than the John Hancock building in, in Boston. And of course, next slide. So what happens is they become born in the upper air currents, ends up coming to New England as acid rain. And the largest source of air pollution in Massachusetts, in fact, comes from out of state. Because the uh, winds blow that pollution in from 
power plants in the Midwest than the Western United States. So that geographic displacement is another strategy. What I really want to focus on, next slide, is, um, oh, we'll skip this one in the interest of time. It's kind of interesting. Oh, no, what the hell, we'll just do it anyway. Uh, one of the most dominant ways that you can dispose of uh, toxic waste is deep well injection. If you do it right, the toxic waste becomes trapped underground. If you cut corners and don't do it right, then it might take 20 years, but eventually it might migrate into drinking water. Um, but by then the company's long gone, they made their money. Um, but you've contaminated a major source of drinking water for a population, and once that happens, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to reclaim that water. Silicon Valley, I wouldn't drink anything out of the aquifers there. I mean, the levels of contamination, chemical contamination in groundwater is really quite uh, significant. So if you can time delay the impact or the realization that there's a problem, that's another strategy. But here's what I really want to talk about for the purposes of today's uh, talk, is what I call selective victimization. And that is, as pollution becomes increasingly commodified as a result of environmental policy, more and more of it's becoming mobile and it's being displaced into communities that have less political economic power to defend themselves against these types of problems. So for example, one of the national solutions that was adopted in state after state to medical waste, to garbage, and to toxic waste is incineration. That is, you're just going to burn it. The problem with incineration is it produces super toxics out of the smokestacks, dioxins, heavy metals, mercury, really bad stuff. You don't want to live near an incinerator. Your life is in danger, literally, if you live near an incinerator. So obviously in California, no one wants to live near an incinerator. No one wants to incinerate in their community. So the state of California is having difficulties, and they contracted Sorrell Associates to help them figure out how can we build these incinerators. So on page 51 of their report, they conclude, under no circumstances should such a facility be built within five miles, uh, within a one to four mile radi radii of a middle class community because of the greater likelihood of encountering political opposition. Instead, the state should target low income communities, Catholic communities, rural communities, and communities where the offending facility is on one side of the political boundary and the affected population is on the other. In other words, because it's harder to bring action, political action against a factory that's not in your own political jurisdiction. They were talking about where the best um, geologic or climatic conditions that would minimize health impacts. It was solely in terms of the opportunities of the community to offer political opposition. So after this was, report was done and released, it's very interesting to look at where did the state of California build its incinerators. So if you look in Los Angeles where they built 17 incinerators in the city, 91% 91, 91 of the people who live in the high impact zone within two miles of those incinerators, 91% of them are people of color. They targeted poor people of color communities within Los Angeles as being the sites for these incinerators. Next slide. And so um, you find this in other reports as well. Um, Chem Nuclear Systems was um, looking for ways to dispose of nuclear waste um, out of North Carolina. So they were contracted by the state to do a report. They conclude that communities least likely to resist and easiest to target are southern, midwestern, and rural are open to promises of economic benefits, typically because they, they need resources and they want tax revenue. Um, they contain uh, residents on average older than middle age and with a high school education. You don't have the uh, means of self-empowerment if you have a limited education. Are low income, you don't have the resources, time, or energy to engage in organizing, or you're not involved in social issues. Again, similar types of conclusions. Next slide. In fact, Mayor Bloomberg of uh, New York City has stated that if you were to put an incinerator on Park Avenue, you would drive away the revenue base that supports the city. You don't put incinerators where the wealthy live, you put them where the poor live, where the marginalized live, right? So where did they put them in Massachusetts? Where did they build the incinerators? So, so this is the town of Lawrence, and in the 1970s, the state decided that that was where they were gonna build their incinerators, and they built four of them, within a 12 square mile area of downtown Lawrence. Now what kind of community is Lawrence? Lawrence is a, uh, is a white working class community in transition. A lot of new immigrants were coming in. Many of them did not speak English as their original language. It's one of the poorer communities in the state, a low income community, increasingly become a community of color. 
So they built four incinerators within a 12 square mile area of the downtown. Each one of these incinerators would produce 5,000 pounds of mercury out of its smokestacks every uh, year um, for about 30 years. Um, and the Biodiversity Institute just did a study and they found that the highest levels of mercury found in the environment anywhere in the entire northeastern United States is in the Merrimack Valley where Lawrence is located. Mercury is a very, very potent neurotoxin. It destroys the neurological system. It's deadly for young kids or uh, children. Um, and uh, in fact, there's an old saying, you ever heard the term Mad Hatter? Um, Mad Hatters, workers who worked in the uh, hat making industry, they used mercury in the formation and the forms of the hat. And after working in the industry a number of years, they would, um, they would basically lose their minds, they would go crazy because the mercury would destroy their neurological systems. So mercury is very, very dangerous, very, very potent. Um, and this community was literally turned into a sacrifice area. Um, and one DEP official who was at president of means told me off the record, they knew there was no way it was politically feasible to build these incinerators in Boston. So Lawrence became a sort of sacrificial land. Yeah? Who did you state built these incinerators? Um, the state uh, permitted them, licensed them, and, uh, but they were operated by different uh, private entities. Yeah. Next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to do this study, and I was looking, I was very interested um, what kinds of racial and class disparities exist in Massachusetts with respect to the distribution of all types of environmental hazards? Do we have the similar problems that you see in Alabama, Georgia, California? I was traveling all around the country doing site visits with uh, communities all across the country. And often you're, oh, you're from Massachusetts, you know, how bad can it be? You can't possibly be as bad as here we are in Alabama, legacy of Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. So I said, all right, I'm very interested in this, so let's do a study and let's find out. So I looked at the entire state, 362 communities. I looked at everything I'd get my hands on. Probably one of the most comprehensive environmental justice studies of any state ever done. So it got a lot of attention. In fact, after this report came out, um, the legislature, which we can talk about this, passed an environmental justice policy. But anyway, so we were looking at um, hazardous waste sites. So in, in low-income communities, there's an average of eight hazardous waste sites per square mile. There's about 30,000 in, in the state. 3,000 of those, 3,700 are considered to be serious. Um, we have a number of Superfund sites, like New Bedford has one. The National Research Council has found if you live in close proximity to a Superfund site, you're at much higher risk for all types of different cancers, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, cardiac abnormalities, birth defects, neurological disorders, and so forth. So living near the serious hazardous waste sites is a problem. So that's a pretty interesting disparity, but if you look at race, racial disparities, next slide, then you'll see something even more profound. So in predominantly white communities, there's an average of two hazardous waste sites per square mile. If you look at communities of color, there's an average of 48 hazardous waste sites per square mile. I mean, what a significant difference. And you don't often see this in the social scientists, but it's like a straight line. It's almost like it's a one-to-one -one correlation. In fact, it is a one-to-one -one correlation. As a community becomes more racially diverse, there's a direct correlation to the increased frequency of hazardous waste sites. And so race is the strongest predictor that I could find of the number of hazardous waste sites that you would find in a community. And this is true nationwide. You find tremendous disparities in the presence of hazardous waste sites all throughout the country. Next slide. Um, this is New Bedford. I don't know, anyone from New Bedford? Mm. You don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, it's just one example. Next slide. So in New Bedford, next slide. In, in New Bedford, um, industry there freely dumped um, PCBs into New Bedford Harbor for years and years and years. Um, this actually, this area right here is right near where a daycare used to be. Um, and so New Bedford Harbor, next slide, is a major Superfund site. And um, they had a plan to incinerate those PCBs that they were digging up from the harbor. And the community was so outraged at this possibility that they actually mobilized and were able to defeat it. One of the few times that it's pro proposed incinerator has been defeated in Massachusetts. Go on the next slide. Um, 
but the PCBs are really, really dangerous because they're implicated in all these different types of cancers. And if you're a pregnant woman, um, they found that they can cause significant neurological damage, motor control problems for children. Next slide. As well as lower IQ. And what a lot of chemicals do, including PCBs, we didn't even talk about this, but it's really interesting, new research on this, is a lot of chemicals are what are called endocrine disruptors. And that is, what they do is they mimic hormones, or they short circuit your endocrine system. Your endocrine system is what produces hormones, right? So why is it that Cape Cod in this area has such high rates of breast cancer? Well, this area, for going back to the 50s, used to have the hell sprayed out of it for, with uh, DDT, for mosquito control. There's a lot of heavy metals produced by industry out of smokestacks here. And those chemicals lodge in the body fat. Um, they bioaccumulate, they move up to the food chain. And they lodge in your body fat. And what happens is they start sending signals out. So they mimic hormones, for example, they might tell your body to start growing cells. So your breast tissue starts trying to grow cells. It grows cancer cells. Um, so more and more research and understanding is taking place around what um, these chemicals are doing. And basically, they're short-circuiting the endocrine system. So if you look at where you're seeing a big explosion of cancers, like cancer of the ovary, breast cancers, in men, testicular cancer, uh, prostate cancer, uh, many of them are disproportionately uh, taking place in organs, parts of the body, that are regulated by sexual hormones. Right? So that's the correlation. Um, and uh, if you ever see this movie, Living Downstream, which is really interesting, by Sandra Steingraber, um, all along the eastern United States and here in Massachusetts, they used to spray schools. They used to go into the schools and spray DDT while the students were in session. And they um, used to go through neighborhoods, and they would go down the street with these big fogging trucks. Anyone remember this? And um, yeah, you remember this. And all the kids in the neighborhood used to run behind the, the trucks and play in the big fog of DDT. Um, my wife remembers doing this with her sisters. Um, and of course, DDT is an endocrine disruptor. It's an organic chlorine-based chemical. And um, her sister died at age 43 from breast cancer and left a five-year-old son. So in this area of the country, there was just tremendous exposure on the part of people growing up to um, these types of pesticides, which are now banned as well as a whole host of industrial chemicals, PCBs, in New Bedford. You know, just enormous suns. Next slide. Um, what's interesting there, too, is that how they built schools in the community right on top of the PCB dumps. Right? And so when their water table rises, it pushes the PCBs up into the um, foundations of the buildings. It becomes part of the atmosphere inside the schools and uh, results in some significant exposure to these very dangerous chemicals. Next slide. Um, um, so here are the schools. Um, next slide. I'm just going over that really quickly in the interest of time. Here are the other schools. New Bedford High School, Keith Middle School, um, all built on um, basically PCB landfills. And same thing, if you go back and look at Love Canal, Hooker Chemical dumped 60,000 tons of docks and another very dangerous chemicals in a big pit called Love Canal, filled it all over, sold it to the Niagara School Board for one dollar, and then the community builds a school on it. So if you look around, and of course when the rains came and pushed all those chemicals up onto the playground and into the homes and the foundations and the, the school buildings itself, and uh, during the height of this, um, uh, one year alone in Love Canal, of their 22 births, only four of them uh, were, were considered normal. The rest involved uh, birth defects of various uh, proportions. So if you look around Massachusetts, you find that it's not uncommon. You have a lot of contaminated ground on which schools have been built because it was cheap. It was cheap for the community to buy, cheap for the school board to buy. They just defeated a proposition in Quincy to build a school on an old town dump there as well. So the point here is sometimes, um, even, in, even in Cambridge they did this, to build a public housing and a kid's ball field on top of the WR Grace waste site, asbestos and heavy metals. So sometimes it's not just people of color um, communities who are having toxics dumped on them, but sometimes communities of color are built on top of toxics. Um, go on to the next one. We'll talk a little bit about Fall River. We'll just keep going here. So skip this one and skip this, skip the next one, skip the next one. 
Um, oh, chemical releases, we'll talk a little bit about this. Go on to the next slide in the interest of time. We were looking at uh, the amount of chemical pollution released in the, in the state from 1990 to 2002. And again, so 19,000 pounds of toxic chemicals released into the air, ground, and water in predominantly white communities, nothing to sneeze at, that's a lot. But it's dwarfed by the almost 200,000 pounds per square mile that was released into communities of color. And there the line really jumps. I mean, it's really a profound, significant difference. Next slide. And next slide. Um, so, um, in Fall River, there's been a lot of analyses done of power plants all around the country. And if you live near power plants, um, if they're significant um, coal-fired power plants, they can take um, months, if not years, off your life. So if you live within, oh, I think it's eight miles, eight miles of the Salem or the Brayton Point power plant, it's estimated that will take 12 to 18 months off your life expectancy because of the impacts of the air pollution. The Brayton Point power plant is the single largest polluter in New England. Um, go on to the next. Um, it's the largest source of CO2, nitrous oxide, um, CO2, uh, that CO2 is sulfur dioxide, and mercury emissions. Um, these two power plants alone are linked to 43,000 different asthma attacks and nearly 300,000 daily incidents of upper respiratory breathing problems in New England, New York, and New Jersey. They are major, major polluters, about 159 premature deaths in the state. Um, and again, most of the health impact is felt within 30 miles of these facilities. So um, this, in my discipline, is called location risk. And so who lives in the closest proximity to power plants? Next slide. What you find is most people who live in close proximity are, again, communities of color and lower income white communities. That they are the most disproportionately impacted because that's where they locate the power plants. I've been testifying in a case in um, Brockton and um, around a power plant there. It's gas power, but they want to build it right across the street from the school. And in my discipline, we have this notion called churning. So what Brockton and Lawrence have in common is that 60% of the people there don't speak English as their first language. There's a community is highly fragmented by uh, immigrants that come from many different places of the world. Cape Verde, for example, Brockton, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and Lawrence. And so as a result of that, it's very difficult for residents in that community to come together and form a united front because they come from very different backgrounds. They speak very different languages. And so it's much easier for the state and for industry to target those communities because they can't really come together and offer this type of political opposition. And to some degree, um, New Bedford shares that characteristic. But with regard to power plants, they're like incinerators. People don't want power plants in their community. So power plants are located disproportionately all across the United States and in Massachusetts in those communities that have less political economic, or the six worst polluting power plants in Massachusetts are located in lower income communities. Next slide. Um, so um, Fall River is kind of interesting as a low income community because it's been targeted for a number of different things. The Weaver's Cove Energy and Hesnell LNG, if you're familiar with the liquid nat natural gas terminal proposal here. Um, be located adjacent to a residential neighborhood, a school, at least two nursing homes, and family development. Um, the offload bird was similar. Um, these are the neighboring uh, communities that would be impacted. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. If someone knows more about it, then I welcome your input. But from what I can gather, um, an LNG explosion would basically cause uh, burns on people up to a mile away uh, from the facility, depending on the nature of the accident. So they're not, they're not typical, but they are possible. And um, for example, the city of Boston considered it unacceptable um, to have large LNG containerized ships coming in through Boston Harbor, right? So this is a proposal to build such a facility um, here in Fall River. And the trucks that would come in and offload the natural gas would result in 36,000 um, truck trips per year. There's a neighboring community here, Freetown, um, which is primarily a community of color that was also targeted for a number of major warehouse facilities that they built 
right at the end of these residential streets. And the truck traffic was unbelievable that was going to be coming through these quiet, sleepy um, community. But it was targeted because it was predominantly an African-American community. It didn't have much political power in the state legislature and it didn't have much of a voice. Go on to the next slide. Um, still the waste site. Um, a lot of waste is uh, deposited here. Um, 165 acres north end of the Fall River. Um, and there's been problems with the emissions there in terms of hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide. So we'll go to the next slide. How much time do I have? How late am I? How late am I going? Someone tell me. Three fifteen. Three fifteen. So I got five minutes. <laughs> okay. Next, um, go over the next next one. Next one, please. All right. So where does Fall River rank? Um, this is some of the data pulled together. There's 303 hazardous waste sites in Fall River. That's about almost eight per square mile in the community. There are four landfills. Um, this is a number that really caught my eye. 1990-2002, over 7 million pounds of toxic chemical pollution released into the community here, into the air, water, and ground. Um, of that total, 772,000 pounds of carcinogens, 501 million pounds of reproductive toxins. Reproductive cost, uh, toxins are chemicals that cause birth defects and reproductive disorders. Um, so by my calculations, if you add up everything that's here, incinerators, power plants, you name it, tire piles, landfills, everything, it's the 11th most extensively overburdened city in Massachusetts. Out of 362 communities, it ranks the 11th most environmentally overburdened. So this notion is that there are certain communities which are serving sort of as ecological sacrifice zones. I think Fall River is one of these type of communities. New Bedford certainly is because it ranked fourth. Um, I teach at Northeastern University. Right next to, door to us is Roxbury. It's another uh, lower income community of color, predominantly 90% African American. There's something like six trans trash transfer stations built in Roxbury. They truck trash from all over Boston and take it to Roxbury. That's a, that's a permitting decision. That's the state deciding where they're going to put those facilities. And again, they're targeting um, the communities that they see as having the least political economic power within the larger system. So keep going real quickly, and I'll wrap up. I just want to show you this really quick. If you're in red, out of the 362 communities, if you're in red, that means you're, in my view, one of the 30 most environmentally overburdened communities in the state. These are all communities of color. There's 34 of them. Look how many of them make the list of the worst 30. It's like 80%. Um, now, there's only, they only represent nine communities of, uh, communities of color represent only 9% of all the communities in Massachusetts. So you'd only expect to see 9%, not 80%. So what a, what a powerful indicator. This makes Massachusetts, we're just as bad as Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, California, New Mexico, right? These racial disparities and class disparities are as profound as you'll find anywhere else in the country. So we'll go all the way to the end here in the interest of time. Keep going. Go all the way to the end. So um, uh, I've been part of a really interesting component I'm working with grassroots environmental organizations. Uh, I'm on the board member of the Alliance for Healthy Tomorrow, which is a coalition of 165 different organizations. And uh, I always said that the notion here, the goal of the environmental justice movement is not to ensure that all people are polluted equally. That's not what I'm kind of in this about. The goal is not to have it in my backyard, not to have it in your backyard, but not to have it in anyone's backyard. And so how do you move away from the notion of distributive justice to productive justice? How do you attack the production of ecological hazards at its source so that no one be impacted at all? So the Alliance for Healthy Tomorrow really is a coalition. You got labor, you got student organizations, environmental justice organizations, mass council churches, you got religious organizations, you got mass nurses associations, health professionals. This broad-based new type of coalition <laughs> that is pushing for the mandatory phase-out of toxic chemicals by uh, Massachusetts industry that would mandate the re replacement of toxic chemicals with safer substitutes that are economically viable. We would be the first state in the country to require the phase-out of toxic chemicals for use in Massachusetts. 
Governor Patrick already told me he would sign it. Europe has already moved in this direction. The way it works now in Europe, the burden is placed upon industry to prove that a chemical is safe before it can be introduced into the marketplace. Here in the United States, the burden is placed upon you guys, the public, to prove that a chemical is dangerous after it's been introduced in the marketplace. And that's very difficult, if not impossible, to do. So this shifts the whole burden of proof away from industry and moves us in the direction of clean production. And that's a type of transformative environmental politics. And we would be the first state in the country to do that. So despite the magnitude of the crisis that I just outlined to you, there's some very, very exciting things happening in Massachusetts. And I think I would encourage all of you to become engaged, particularly young people in the room, because it's really your future. Um, you're inheriting an ecological crisis which is unsurpassed, whether you're looking at climate change or the pet threats posed by chemicals to your health and well-being and to your children that will come after you. So I think you have this opportunity and perhaps even this obligation to take the bull by the horns, grab the mantle, and become engaged in the effort to build a transformative environmental politics in Massachusetts and around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you.